Hi, everyone. Welcome to Office Hours. Great to have you here. If you're watching on YouTube, you can find out more about what we do at officehours.global. Our first hour, always a general discussion of production and IT-related topics where we answer audience-submitted questions. So if you've been around for a while, you probably know the process. The show is driven by what you are interested in. Uh, so put your questions in and most importantly, vote on those questions because the highest voted questions are what we talk about the longest and in the most detail. Second hour, typically a deeper dive into a topic. Today we're going to be talking about one of the most critical posts in large crews, that of technical director or TD. In our second hour, Brad Woodall, a longtime TD for major broadcast sports, who is currently with Amazon's Thursday Night Football Package, is going to be here to answer your questions about how the TD position works. So that's our second hour. But this is our first hour, which means we're going to answer your questions. Mitch, what have we got today? <laughs> Thank you, Bill. First in, Graham Cardwell from Belfast, Northern Ireland, asking, I've got two desktop PCs with similar specs in my office, and I only need one. What are some good performance comparison sites or tests to help me decide which one to keep? Courtney Gooden's going to start us out today. Courtney? Well, first I'd look at see which one is the oldest and uh, which one is cleaned last. And then there's there's tons of benchmarks you can run. Uh, here's a list of a bunch of the top ones, the 3D Mark. PC Mark, Geekbench, Nova Bench, Cinema 4D. Depends on what what type of uh, work you're going to be doing on that computer. Whether you want to benchmark it for graphics or benchmark it for just CPU performance or stress test it. Uh, a lot of the one, those ones that I mentioned, PC Mark, Geekbench, uh, can uh, you can let, put them on, let them run over and over again, and you got to get them uh, <clears throat> using uh, get the usage up a lot and stress them so that. Uh, you can see if they're throttling down when they get overheated. And that's the first sign of uh, of a PC that's uh, long of tooth is if they uh, overheat and throttle down, then uh, <clears throat> you need to either clean them, apply new <laughs> new heat sink paste, or uh, get rid of them. Or the memory is probably too slow for, uh, for that machine. So you can start with the benchmarks that I showed there. Mitch? And after you've taken uh, Courtney's advice and decided which one was going to be your primary, uh, Murphy's, I think it's fourth law, subchapter S says, save the second one, because as soon as you replace it, it will break down. And next question. Next question for David Brady in New York, New York. We've got an IPTV solution at one of our locations. What is the simplest method of creating an RTSP stream to add in as a channel, I think a time-sensitive movie trailer that we can quickly add to the head end. Would VLC do? Alex, help us out. It would depend on the resolution and the quality that you're looking for. I mean, you could probably actually get something that is a simple, you know, some a relative, I mean, relatively simple there. There's cards, ARM-based ones. One th thing that we're looking at right now is the um, the Mikotronics A58. Um, it's, I don't know if it's available in the United States yet. It's, it's a Chinese site. It'll do up to 8K on an ARM chip. Um, and uh, and so it's it looks like a really, the board looks really, really interesting. A couple of us have been watching it for a little while. Um, so that's a single, like, solid state board and there's a couple boards that will do compression and rtsp should be one of the one of the compression pieces that they use of course you can use things if you have a, a spare pc laying around you can use obs um you know that that should work just fine uh so so th those are probably the the two simplest ways if it depends on whether you want something that's going to be solid state or whether it's something that can run on a computer and it depends on what you have laying around thank you and next question Roscoe Jones from Madison, Indiana, has a question. What is an inexpensive way to send a 1080p HDMI out wirelessly, 150 feet, to five monitors with HDMI inputs? Usually the same source to all five, but it would be awesome if two could switch, uh, if you could switch to a different source with embedded audio. This is not iMag. Chris Fenwick, give us some suggestions. So, Roscoe, you say it's not iMag. It could still be a lot of different things. Um, I would consider, I know that there's ways to send wireless HDMI, but I would consider just using Wi-Fi. Uh, and I would put a local device at each one of the monitors. It could be, you know, one of the little raspberry ju mint juleps or whatever they're called, the pies. Um, or like a, a Mac Mini, use Wi-Fi and then generate the signal locally. That's, that's what I would consider doing if that works for you. Alex, follow? 
Yeah, I don't know how many wireless solutions other than Wi-Fi would really be cost effective for you. I mean, I think you're looking at like Holly Lands or at, at 150 feet. There's a lot of smaller things and less expensive things that, that will run 20 feet or 30 feet. But once you go to 150 feet, you may need to run wires or you're going to need to use and Wi-Fi may be an option, but it's still going to be uh, that's a long distance for Wi-Fi to run videos stably. So you may that may or may not work. Um, one thing that we've done with lots and lots of monitors, it's not necessarily over uh, wireless, is using multicast. So multicast allows you to, there's a variety of pieces of hardware. Um, we worked on some golf things where we had 250 monitors that we had to supply. And um, and what you do is you, there are little boxes that are not very expensive. I think they're $150 each or something like that. And we pop them into the back of the TV with an HDMI out, plug in an Ethernet, and you set up your multicast network. At that point, you can actually change the signal. If you're multicasting a bunch of different things that make them available, you can change the signal for any any given set of TVs to the signals that are available. Um, you have to be careful of if you're providing this as part of a larger network, you either need to work with the, I, your IT coordinators to make that work uh, because they won't multicast. Um, is not something most people are fond of. So we usually do it in its own network um, and, uh, it, and allow it to work there. But multicast is how, if you go to a, a hotel room or a, or a uh, stadium and you see all those monitors at the stadium, that's all multicast. So uh, typically, so, so that's how that, that actually gets worked out. So I would take a look at, at some multicast solutions there. I don't have any specific pieces of hardware off the top of my head, but, um, but, the, um, but those are, that's a good solution to take a look at. Thanks for your question, Roscoe. Hope that took care of it. And let's move to the next question. Andy Kokendorfer from Vieira, Florida. What would you consider to be the minimum spec portable Mac for concurrent four to five megabit live streaming on one machine? The player console has dual 1080p streams, one for projection and one for iMag. Thanks. Ooh, portable. I'm Alex. Oh, Mac Mini will do that in, in its sleep. So, I mean, I think that you could you could definitely have a Mac Mini um, doing this compression for you. Uh, one or two dual uh, dual 1080p streams shouldn't be a problem at all. Um, so I, I think that you – oh, and, and now if you're looking for – the one thing I will say is that are you actually looking um, – you know, you're, you're on a live stream, but you're talking about iMag. Anytime you're streaming, you can't, I mean, we, the, the, here's the problem with iMag. iMag, for those of you watching, is the big screens that you see on either side of the stage. The problem with those is that the, the, the latency of just the video hardware is too slow. So if you're trying to get to the iMag, you need, I mean, to do it properly, you need genlocked cameras into an entirely genlocked system to not lose any frames on the way through the pipeline. Um, and you have to be very careful of what you're, what you're putting up there because uh, it is, you'll notice that the sync is off because you can't delay the audio in the room. So if you're doing iMag, then you can't stream anything because that'll be you know, measured in seconds. <laughs> you know, so it won't work at all. But if you are um, streaming out to the rest of the world, then what I just, re then an, the Mac Mini will be plenty powerful to do it. I mean, eight, eight gig Mac Mini will do it. Um, but but if you're trying to do it to an iMag, you you'll need to you want your entire subsystem to be as as uh, pared down as possible. Mitch Hill, um, I'm thinking that some people may not know what an iMag is. Maybe we can it's refresh the big your... on either side. Of image the stage. magnification. Yeah, it, it, the, image the magnification. Short it's, the, it's to make people. It's the big screens on either side of the on, on either side of the stage. Yeah, and in in that kind of environment, even a little bit of lip sync slip is a bad thing for the audience. So it's not it can get away from you really quickly. So it you know it's yeah. always going to be a little off. There's always going to be some loss getting to the screen of a couple frames, but it can you know people who aren't paying attention to it running through a bunch of stuff can get into five, six, eight frames of delay, and it, and then it looks really bad. Next question, and I've got one. Uh, what's your favorite workflow for using time code on set? Do you use multiple DAD TC1s, for example? Courtney Gooden, start us off. Well, it's changed since I was always using timecode on set. Uh, my preferable way is to have uh, area Lexes or, or uh, cameras that have uh, built-in jammable timecode generators built in. You jam, you plug a, uh, a sync box one from Denneke into them and jam them at the morning in the morning and jam them after lunch. And don't worry about them. The newer way, the, the tentacle uh, boxes have Bluetooth where they talk back and forth to each other uh, and will automatically rejam the cameras or feed them. If you don't have professional cameras, we'll feed a uh, LTC or linear time code or longitudinal time code signal into one of the microphone ports or the audio ports on the camera. 
which will use then uh, that audio signal recording of the the uh, linear time code that can then be used in post to sync it up. Uh, I prefer to have it in the metadata uh, because it's easier to use. You don't have to load it into a workstation to tell what the time code is on a on a clip because you have software that can read it in the metadata without having to play it back to decode it. Uh, and of course, uh, the old standby, the uh, Enneke time code slate or ones that are available from Ambient or a variety of other places now as a good backup because then you have an on-camera visualization of the time code. You jam sync that time code slate to your audio time code generator, which is in your recorder and work with the time code recorder. Uh, I mean, a recorder that has time code generator built into it with a high degree of accuracy. So just take that time code out, feed it to the slate. Then that way you have a reference on any camera that can shoot the slate, whether it's got a time code generator or not. Mitchell. Yeah, I like the Denneke. I mean, that's what I've always used, but um, I always thought that the uh, person running audio, you know, with their uh, audio sciences, uh, audio science, excuse me, uh, audio devices, Sci uh, what are they called now? Sound devices. Sound sorry. devices. Uh, were uh, the, the central uh, keeper of the time code. But I was on a shoot recently, and they all had TC1s attached to their device, the camera, the, uh, the mix pre, everything. And they jammed them up front, and then somebody was sitting there with a, with a phone uh, operating the, uh, uh, the various TC1s uh, within, uh, within 30 or 40 feet of them. To get the uh, the same yeah, that's the Bluetooth one. Bluetooth communication that goes between them, and there's yeah. an app that you can sync them up with too. Alex, yeah, we see some of the smaller uh, some of the smaller productions are using things like tentacles and de deities. They're they're um, probably not quite as accurate as when you move up to uh, using devices like Ambient. Uh, Ambient makes its own time code transmitters as well, in addition to the to the slate, and so you can jam those to the slate, and then and then have the slate there as a as a single point of truth. Um, so, so I think that those uh, usually um, we see more things like ambience plugged into things, and then otherwise we often jam sync all the hardware. So, and like uh, Courtney said, we'll jam sync the the Aries or Sony's or or other things to to ha to take that um, take that time code. Um, oftentimes, it is better if we can feed it to the to the devices um, all the time. It keeps them all, and I find it keeps them all in the same place more often um, to make that actually work. Uh, we do the, the advantage of having a, a visual slate like a Denneke or an Ambient is that you really can just ab be absolutely sure that all the cameras or the cameras that you're using are have the time code that you think that they have um, to have that. We start the slate, we, we start rolling the camera on the slate. So the slate is in frame when we start rolling the camera. That way you have all the information you need on the camera on the, on the first frame. So when you're going through videos, you can see what they look like and you see time of day and you can see a lot of other things. It's really, really useful. Um, the other thing, in a pinch, uh, we've used. The, there's an iPad app called Time, uh, called Smart Slate, I think, or Slate Movie Slate, um, and it will run time code. I wouldn't try to jam it. It does do jamming. I wouldn't try to do that. But in a pinch, if I've got a bunch of cameras, opening that thing up and letting it run and having all the cameras see it, um, even though it may not jam correctly, it will give a number <laughs> that is useful for all of those cameras to type in later into your NLE and uh, resync them. So. Um, that's not the preferable way to do it, but it is a way that will get the job done sometimes. Courtney, you had a follow-up? Uh, yeah, one thing to remember is uh, uh, there are the more professional time code generators that you put on the camera also have tri-level sync out. So it synchronizes, it not only sends the time code signal, uh, but it also sends a sync signal to drive the camera so that the camera starts each frame at the beginning of each frame of time code. Otherwise, if you're just sending in longitudinal time code or time code that doesn't have a sync to the camera, when they turn on the camera, it'll be plus or minus one frame because uh, it's either a half frame before or half frame after. So when you go and sync it up, it could be you know uh, uh, up to one frame out of sync. So uh, just bear that in mind. Mitch, this is your question. Do you have a follow up? Yeah, my follow up is Courtney is exactly right. And if you go to the lower end of the the the, the crewing and equipment. Um, Sometimes it's just good enough to have the camera, um, on-camera microphone on and uh, record your audio separate and then post like Premiere or Final Cut. Um, it can actually do a pretty darn good job of syncing up the audio tracks if it can hear one and the other. Alex, do you want to come back again? Yeah, and 
I just want to, the caveat here is that we're all talking right now about post. So this is time code for post. Uh, when we're doing live, we're using master clocks. And these are oftentimes 1U units that are generating clock for everything in the entire production. Um, so that's an entirely different ball of wax that we'll manage some other time. There you go. All right. Excellent. Let's move on to the next question. Here's Graham Cardwell from Belfast, Northern Ireland asking, is it okay to run a tower desktop on its side? I don't use it very often as I use Macs now. So I want to put it in a cupboard, but it's a bit too tall. Courtney, help us. Well, putting it in the cupboard may be the problem. Uh, airflow is what you got to take into consideration. So it depends. It depends if the intakes... Uh, if, if it has one side that's open with a bunch of fan intakes on it, you don't want to put that side down against something. So you want to make sure that their air can get into that. So prop it up on something. You can run them horizontally or vertically. I've run them. A lot of uh, older PC cases came uh, with uh, feet. You could put them either, either way, run them horizontally or vertically. Um because they all have forced air cooling usually, so that's not a problem as long as you don't block the vents on one side of the cabinet. So make sure there's airflow that can get into this whatever side is sitting down if you put it horizontally. Thank you very much. Next question. Gordon Lake, Los Angeles, California, asking, with the Disney ESPN Catalyst stage, are LED walls becoming a requirement for most live TV sets? Alex. I don't know about most live TV sets, but definitely for sports. And, and you know, they're big sports like things to be flashy. Uh, the the kind of the general look of sports tends to be clean and long lines and, and not as. Um, and so that tends to lend itself towards digital uh, much, much better. Uh, I think that overall, I think it gives them a lot of flexibility. You have one set that they get to use over and over and over again with lots of different needs. So I think that that, that makes a lot of sense for, for them. And in the past, I think what we're starting to see it pick up speed is, in the past, uh, the LED pitch was too was too high, and so you'd see some array and so on and so forth. But they've solved most of those problems with better pitch and and just uh, camera technique and so on and so forth. So the the LED walls have gotten a lot better, and with that, uh, the tech has gotten a lot better. I think most of these LED sets are not the way we see them in something like Mandalorian, where it's generally built around a single camera shoot that is tracking all kinds of the stuff in the distance um, and creating parallax. And and every time the camera moves, you'll see the image moving across the the uh, LED wall. I, I believe that most of these are static, you know, so they are, they have that background back there. Um, and, uh, and then they're, they're making, they're basically that, that it's much easier to do that with multi-camera than, um, than with the kind of the moving shot there. So there are ways to do it with multi-camera. It's really complicated. <laughs> so, um, so generally um, that's, uh, that's probably what you're seeing there. It's going to pick up speed. Um, they're just really expensive. So where it makes sense is when you're building a set that you have a lot of budget, you've got a lot of power, and those, those LED walls take up a lot. So you have a lot of CapEx budget that you can spend on the entire set, but you want to reduce how many sets you have to build. Um, so for large networks and, and so on and so forth, it makes sense. I'm not sure if it totally makes sense for smaller networks. And I still, you get a lot of physical sets still because if you want to start doing things like pick up the camera and, and run around with a, you know, and go anywhere and, and shoot it. It, it. There are places where the, the set doesn't work, you know? So, so, so the, uh, uh, so some, in some cases people are still using physical sets. And I would say at, in pure numbers, the, the number of physical sets greatly outnumber the number of LED sets, but in, uh, in the uh, network area, you'll probably see more and more of them. Courtney. Yeah. Alex covered a lot of it. You know, it, uh, you have to outweigh, you know, weigh the cost of that LED screen and the power against uh, multiple sets. If you're going to use the same studio for four different shows, you can change the background set to look like a completely different set, especially if it has little uh, proscenium LEDs that go across the top and down the sides. You can put different set elements on those. You see that a lot in, in uh, award shows now where they used to have to have, you know, five different looks for the award show. Now they just put LED screens everywhere and change the look uh, using, uh, digital assets to put on the background. So it's, if it's, if you've got a, a one set that you can use for five shows, you amortize the cost of building five sets or having five studios. If you're doing a daily show, let's say for a local TV show that does a, a morning news set, a noon news set, an evening news set. And in the meantime, they do some public affairs programs or interviews or something they can then, um, have just different backgrounds for each of those and use the same stage. 
uh, for every single one of them. And that's going to save them a lot of money. So uh, those, and like Alex said, the tight pitched LED walls are a lot more expensive than the older ones, which a lot of the older new sets are still trying to pay off. Uh, but they're gradually going to the uh, the smoother ones that don't create the more A. Yeah, and if you watched our Cinegear coverage, one of the things we saw there was there were quite a few of these LED sets. And the most impressive one to me, they had a motion control camera combined with an LED array. Um, and they were able to, I, I watched them do two shots that would have been impossible to do at the same time. They had a young lady kind of mountain climber and the camera was started out with a POV over her head shooting down at her. So it looked like you were above her watching her cling to the wall. They cut away to B-roll and in a matter of uh, three or four seconds, she changed her position on the wall. The camera changed and the entire LED wall background changed its geometry so that it was a totally realistic shot of her hanging on the mountain from a camera position off to the left. There's no way you could ever do anything like that in reality. And so the efficiency of getting two shots out of one setup on an LED, that big thing. Um, by the way, don't forget this show is driven by your questions. We're always looking for your questions and your votes. Your votes are critical to that. Tell us what you want us to get to uh, more quickly and the number of votes determines what we go to. So always remember that you are a big part of the show if you're watching it, and you can get in and determine what we deal with next. Let's go to the next question. Jason Robert Shaw from Sarasota, Florida has a question. Sending audio from HyperDeck Studio HD Mini into a Zoom. Is routing the HyperDeck audio through my A10 Mini Extreme ISO and then into the Rodecaster the best option? Chris Fenwick, start us off. I don't know about best, uh, Jason, but it'll totally work. Uh, and and I'm, I apologize. I don't know if you're on a Mac or a PC, but uh, the system that I've built up that I've been trying to push on everybody here, um, the ATEM software shows up in loopback as an audio source. So it actually appears in my SoundDesk software as a channel. It appears on my Korg nano controller as a fader. And I can decide whether or not I want to push that into a Zoom meeting or broadcast it to wherever. And it works quite well. I have, you know, independent gain control of it and it routes in just fine. Alex? Yeah, I, I, um, I would use an audio to an SDI to audio device. Like sound devices makes one for a couple, not sound devices, Blackmagic makes one for a couple hundred bucks. And uh, so then you just have the, the SDI go into there, it pops out audio, and then I make, move it into my mixer. If you can, definitely go through the switcher. But I, I generally recommend, if you're really serious about your audio, is to get it into a real mixer. <laughs> you know, and, and, then, and then let it, and then, and then mix it. it it's, I know it sounds crazy. In a pinch, I think you could do what you're talking about. Um, and it would work. I, I think that, but I would probably get it, get it like, even like a little, uh, uh, you know, um, what is it, the R, R18 or whatever from, from Behringer or something small to do your mix um, and get everything into analog into that. I highly recommend it. Let's go to the next question. Douglas Carmichael, Miele, the German home appliance maker, used a hired host for their IFA 2022 press event instead of a corporate staff member. Is that a common practice? Alex. It is, and I wish more companies would do it. So, um, so I think that, you know, I think that there's this whole thing that we get into where they want to have their, someone in the C-suite uh, do the announcement and everything else. And unless they're good at it and very well practiced and very well trained, I don't think it's a good look for the, the corporation. I, I think that generally it looks, you know, they're just, it's very flat and, and they may be very charismatic in person, but when you get them up there reading a teleprompter and doing those things, it, it, it really isn't, isn't a great solution in my opinion. So, yeah, so I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't recommend um, that that process. Yeah, Courtney. Yeah, you see these all the time at uh, uh, trade shows, auto shows, especially spokesmodels. You know, they hire uh, good-looking people, men and women, to present the latest. Uh, you know, Firebird XL five seventy, and they have to learn all the corporate uh, speak if they're doing corporate stuff, and they have to learn all the technique technical jargon for whatever device they're presenting and they do it well. They're actors that uh, train uh, to do these type of presentations. And there's a whole class of uh, performers that do this for a living and they just go from trade show to trade show, memorizing their little spiel and presenting it. Alex. Yeah. One of the things about it is that, <laughs> that the, um, uh, 
uh, they have more time to practice too. So if you give them a script, uh, they have a lot more time to practice that script than you're going to get with, um, you know, with other with other options. And so that that helps a lot because the, the CEO is not going to be able to spend all that time doing that. And so that that really is a is kind of a, 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 a real key piece of the puzzle is to have someone who can work on it for weeks or months uh, and without having any other meetings or without anything else. And so a lot of times when you see that, you see that that uh, um, that that's oftentimes what's happening there and it works pretty well. We even used to see that in the corporate work in, in things like uh, not just the trade shows that were public facing, but the internal corporate communications meetings. I've worked with some CEOs who were very good in front of the camera or in front of the audience, but I've worked with some who were not. And uh, I remember with one of my largest clients, they actually had hired a young woman out of Florida who worked for the Disney organization. They She became their kind of customer and they used her not only in their advertising, but they brought her into the actual corporate all hands meetings. And the fluidity and the enjoyment of watching her interact with everyone, because she was such a skilled performer, really elevated the meeting to the next level. She was able to appropriately tease the CEO about a product or something like that. And just everybody had much more fun at the meeting because there was a proper talent kind of centered around that. It was a really nice thing, and it kind of woke me up to the possibilities of this. So I think, yeah. Let's move to the next question. Next one in from Paul Wallace in Austin, Texas. WordPress has a new AI plugin that can generate and edit text called the Jetpack A1 Assistant. And it's available free to WordPress.com users for a limited time. Will you use this? Alex, what say you? I'll remind you that content is easy to make or easy to read, but rarely both. Um, and, and so having AI do it, uh, you know, this is your like you communicating what you're <laughs> what you do out uh, giving it a hand enough to ai probably i'm not going to add that anytime soon you know yeah. it's interesting hard to tell the future but yeah this is the topic of the day sometimes i will say I, I will say that there, there i saw a use case for ai that i i think is going to explode people what? are now using it was in the wall street journal this morning i think it people are now using um uh, chat GPT mixed with us a voice simulator to tie up telemarketers. So you call them and it just starts talking to them. It just starts. For the just starts, No, but you, I kid you not. Like it comes out as like, oh, this is a good idea. In a year, it'll be impossible. Like well, within two years, telemarketing will be dead because people will just hire a service for 10 bucks a month. So there'll be telemarketers telling you about the service, but for 10 bucks a month, it'll just, you'll, you, you'll just forward the call to that number and it will just, just talk to them. And the mistake it's making right now is I read the article, it's like asking random odd questions and take, it's trying to torture them. I'm like, don't torture them. Just keep them on the line. You know, like just, just be like, Hey, this sounds great. Uh, I used to do that when I, between jobs, when I was in, uh, between like freelance jobs, when I had time and I was cleaning my house, if someone called, if a telemarketer called, I would uh, see how long I could keep them on the line. And I would get into it and I'd go, Oh, that's, that's exactly what I need. I mean, this is this is amazing. I, I'm, I really am glad you called me today. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I got another call. Can, can, can I put you on hold for a second? And then I'd leave him there for a couple minutes. And then I come back, oh, I'm sorry, what were we talking about again? Oh, right. And then we'd talk about it a little longer. And then I, I but only like, I do like 30 seconds. My record was 37 minutes. I keep somebody just just hanging on the line. And and if and if uh, you get, if you, if you turn AI onto that, that it could get good at, and it would be doing good for the whole world. <laughs> so, so just, just to, to just drive, you know, to just drive the telemarketers into the ground. And so um, I think, uh, I think we're going to, I, I think that's going to happen. Like, I think it's going to happen in the next couple of years that people are just going to pay for a service and we'll never get those calls again because the efficiency of telemarketing is that you hang up. It's that you, as soon as you hear them, you hang up. That, that's what they want. If you're not interested at all, they want you to hang up so they can move to the next call. If, if you hang them for even four or five minutes of them trying to figure out whether you're AI or not, the entire system will collapse. So it's going to be interesting. You sent a cold chill up my back because for two months of my life <laughs> as a young, young man, I had to do a telemarketing yeah. job. <laughs> About to get really you complicated were my really nemesis. fast. <laughs> it was, so I apologize to the universe. Chris Fenwick, your thoughts? Yeah, Alex, uh, I appreciate you as a friend, as a as a uh, a visionary in our industry, but what you were just saying, I cannot get behind it more. I totally agree. I used to do the exact <laughs> same thing. Uh, I too, I actually would record them on, on a little flip camera. Uh, some of the good lines are, Oh, hold on. I really like what you're saying. Can you hold? I need to go get a pencil. 
Yeah, yeah. I want to take some notes. Watch TV for 10 minutes. Oh, sorry, I can't find... Oh, this this pen doesn't have ink. Well, and the thing is, is that... if if, Come back and say, okay, sorry, I found paper, I found a pen. Could you start over? Just from the beginning. If you take the AI and you feed it into a learning model, the the thing is, is the AI will keep getting better at it. So it'll keep on seeing what things it did that held people longer, and it will become ninja. (laughs) <laughs> of, 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 Chris, of I think out. I got you on and, the line one time when I was and doing. Not that. only is it important, <laughs> but it is your civic duty to do this. Like, like it, th- this is this is a, an industry that should not exist at all. I'm, I'm going to so speak up for the 20 year olds trying to make their rent. Doing another, another job. It's the only job. There's they better can get. jobs to get, Bill, and you know it. You're Don't right, and I'm glad that I do- dove out of it after two months, but I was trying to make rent. <laughs> I take keep, anything. Keep them get. on the line as long as you anyway. possibly can. All right. Anyway. Interesting topic. And AI, another area that AI is changing things, and let's move on to the next. Oh, Chris, I'm sorry. Mitch Hill pit. Well, I just have end. a quick solution. I know we veered off topic here, but uh, the telemarketer problem could be solved very quickly. Have them pay for your phone service. It could be the telemarketing phone service, and it's open to take telemarketing calls. You're, you're, it's you a don't free, have to pay anything. Free services, but you have to pick up the phone. Uh, I don't yes. know. I, I'd pay. Yeah. I would 100% pay to not, ah, <laughs> not do that. <laughs> Let's move on to the next question. All right. Next question is for me. Courtney. How does the writer's strike uh, continue? I'm, I'm missing some of my favorite TV shows. Uh, Cordy Gooden. Me too. I especially miss the the monologues, the late night comedy shows and uh, talk shows. Uh, there's still, I was out to lunch at the Smokehouse the other day, right off across the street from Warner Brothers. They're still marching up and down there. What's going on right now is they're in negotiations with Screen Actors Guild with the producers and they can't conduct two negotiations at the same time. So Writers Guild is not at the table currently. Uh, and SAG is holding out for uh, higher residuals for hit streaming shows. So that's what is the sticking point right now. With uh, they say this, the talks are going well with screen act- with uh, the actors, but uh, they want uh, higher residuals to be paid on top of their regular residuals if a, a streaming show has a large number of viewers. But unfortunately, the number of viewers is uh, cataloged and, and kept only by the streaming services. They don't share that information. So it'd be tough for the uh, guild to get that information from each individual streamer uh, on the popularity of a particular show. So there's no single company that does metrics like that. So that's a problem. The other problem is uh, for WGA is they're waiting, the studios are waiting for a force majeure uh, contract element to kick in which happens after a certain number of days or months uh which happens i think it runs out uh, tomorrow the 30th the end of this month so um at that point they can lay off people that they have uh, long-term contracts with that are writers and showrunners they can just uh let let them out of their con they terminate their contract uh after a certain period of time of force majeure sets in and that happens tomorrow, I think. So once they can get out of a lot of those contracts, then they'll be the producers will be in a better position at the bargaining table because all those people will be unemployed. Their contracts will have ended. So after tomorrow, I think the negotiations will take on a different uh, uh, different status when they start up again. But that won't be until after the Screen Actors Guild comes to a conclusion and terminates their bargaining uh, with the producers. So that's that's my take on it for right now. This is Hedda Hopper in Hollywood. <laughs> Mitchell Hill. Do, do you feel this is a correction, uh, Courtney, that they're just getting, going on record because streaming services are eating into the, uh, everybody's income in some way? Well, it's a paradigm shift, you know, because previously a lot of contracts, especially actors' contracts, any people, that, anyone that gets directors, writers, that gets residuals, the residuals was based on box office or um, uh, the number of times a show shows on network television. You know, if they air it, the number of times it airs. With streaming, you don't know how many times it airs because anybody can stream it anytime they want to, as many times as they want to. So that metric is really hard to gauge. Uh, and, and box office, if it doesn't ever show up in a theater, there's no box office returns. If they're using a, a major film like HBO has a, a new production that they normally would throw into theaters for uh, you know a few weeks to play off, but they put it on their streaming s- service for uh, exclusively on their streaming service. 
to to uh, get new subscriptions, then uh, the people that have uh, payer or have contracts that are based on a piece of the back end of box office, you know, don't get any money because there's no box office. So they have to uh, renegotiate that kind of stuff. And it's really hard to negotiate those kinds of terms if there aren't any means of measuring viewership or any common means of measuring viewership. And that's the sticking point in almost all those residual based uh, contracts. Things are shifting. Uh, Alex. Yeah, it, it's going to be really interesting to see because for the streaming networks, I don't know. I think they could last a long time because the issue with broadcast was is that, you know, the nightly, you know, obviously the late, late night show, or, which I guess is no longer around, but the late show and, the, and the, those kinds of shows need the writers to, to be there to do that. But I'm watching a series right now that's four years old, <laughs> you know, like, and, and we're working through that. And there are in a streaming net, um, network, uh, you know, whether it's Apple TV or Netflix or other ones, I don't know how many, how quickly people are just going to quit because there's such a back catalog for a lot of these and there's a lot of content to flow around. They can hold on to people much longer than ABC not getting its advertising revenue for Wednesday because there's no writers, you know, and so I think that that's the that's one of the other things that I was I was thinking about the other day was how hard it is for the writers to 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 um, or, or or SAG or anyone else to really exert it because there's a a much slower flow for the for the um, you know for the companies than what used to be there. It used to be we have to release movies at a certain date, and if we don't have them, we don't we have an open schedule. We have um, or we have things that have to be out on Monday night or. Tuesday night or Wednesday night, but that doesn't occur in the streaming areas where, um, again, if they didn't, if Apple and Netflix and HBO and anything else didn't, didn't release something for a year, I'm not sure I would notice. Like, like, I don't know, like, I don't know, like I have, there's so many things I'm behind on right now. I could go for a long time. And, and I have to say that, and, and we'll probably see this more is that, you know, 70, 80% of my viewing is in YouTube. You know, so, so I don't, you know, so, so where they sit in my world of, of watching things is a much smaller place than it used to be. Um, and I just don't go through the content very fast. And there's all these old, like, I didn't know there was one, what is it called? Travelers. I'm watching on Netflix right now, or my family's watching Travelers on network, Netflix. It ended like three or four years ago. I didn't even know it existed. And so now I'm, we're like slowly working through it. And there's like 20 of those. I mean, I can go for a long time without a new a new product. Um, and I think that that's the challenge that the, that all of the the writers and SAG and everyone else has is that I don't know if the streaming networks really need to release that fast. They can last a very long time. Yeah, go ahead. Yep. Chris? Yeah, but eventually you would notice, Alex. You, you would notice it. You, you said you wouldn't notice in a year, but you'd notice in two years. Maybe. Or I'd just be watching and, more YouTube. And also, let's face it, uh, those of us, and I'll include myself in this, who uh, obtain the majority of their entertainment through YouTube, we're, we're uh, still a minority. In in a in the digitally aware crowd, we're very popular, but most of the country, the bell curve of the country, is not that. No, but I think that when it comes to, I think you're right. I think that YouTube for me is, is something that probably is a lot more, but but I would say that um, a vast majority of the country now has subscription services of some kind, and they and they have you know large, vast um, piles of content that's sitting there waiting for them that they've never seen before and didn't know it existed. So beyond the YouTube thing, I, th I just think that there's an awful lot of people that, because what they're trying, and what I mean by this specifically is, their specific bone to pick is with streaming services. Those are the services that could go a long time. So the thing is, is that the, the, the TV and everything else might be, you know, dangling, but the Netflixes and the HBO Maxes and the, or Max now, or all of those, they can, they, they're like, well, I got a lot of content. I can keep on going for quite some time. And so it'll be interesting. I'm just curious. I think that the strike could last a very long time because I think that they, and they have to try to figure out a way to correct it, but they can't. Um, I, you know, I agree with Courtney though that the force majeure clause, which most people didn't know about, I'd heard about it a, uh, several weeks ago, but that's really the game changer. It is absolutely going to change the the temperature of the negotiation, really, for quickly. the writers. But but yes. what I, but what I'm saying is that for the writers, and again to come back to it, but the streaming networks, I think I think they're just trying to hold out. Like I think the streaming the networks are, are like trouble, we can for sure. last for a long time, and we're not going to make any deals because. 
it, it, it means they have to open their books. It's, it's not just money. It, money is definitely a big piece of it, but it's not just money. Um, and, you know, the, the attitude of the streaming networks are just negotiate more money up front. <laughs> you know, like if you don't, if we're not giving you residuals, you know, we're paying, they're paying a lot of money for the, for the actors that get on there. And they're just like, just, just charge, you know, just charge more. Now, and that works for the, the highest level actors. What it doesn't work for is the, you know, everyone below the A level doesn't have enough leverage to, to, um, you know, negotiate a higher contract just because it's streaming. So let's get a comment from Mitch and Courtney, and then we're going to move on. Mitch? Uh, to Alex's point, um, I was digging through Netflix, which I have to do sometimes, and all of a sudden a show uh, showed up called Suits. And I'm like, oh, I'll give it a shot because nothing else is going on. And I watched uh, an episode. And I said, wow, this is really good. And I, I wonder how long this show is going to last. And I looked over at the number of episodes. There are eight seasons. So I don't know what uh, Netflix is doing, but it seemed like they're churning through some of the shows or they're acquiring uh, the rates of programs. And um, I think they're, you know, there's a face-off going on between the streaming services and the, uh, the Writers Guild. Mitch, don't ever start Doctor Who. Uh, Courtney Gooden. Yeah, old shows, unlike uh, how you used to have to wait for summer reruns of your favorite show on network television. Now, all of the previous years of uh, programming is available anytime to anyone that uh, subscribes to that service. The, the other thing I didn't bring up about the writer strike is they're, they're worried about AI. And they want to put a clause in there that says the producers can't use AI to replace them. I don't know how that's going to be enforceable. Eh, maybe if they get caught at it and improving it, it would be something. And AI is kind of a tool, but the writers want to be able to use it, but they don't want the producers to use it. So writing a contract that has that kind of a clause in there uh, is pretty tough. And I don't know how you're going to be ever be able to enforce it, but that's a sticking point. For the writers, and it's also becoming a clause in contracts for the uh, actors that they don't want the producers to be able to use deep, deep, deep fakes to replace them for reshoots or line changes or European versions or American versions, et cetera, different versions. They want to, they want, still want a piece of that. Or if they do use a deep fake, they still want to get paid. Interesting. All right. Um, and don't forget, this is your chance. We still have room for some more questions. So if you want to toss something in there and make your votes count in terms of what you want, what we want to get to, uh, we've got about 20 more minutes. And at that time, uh, Brad Corder was going to be here and we're going to be talking about our second hour topic. So next question. Thank you, Bill. Uh, next one in from John Fisher in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Follow up on the LED walls. Are they the preferred solution over projection mapping? And will we see something like the volume used in live events? Alex. It depends. Um, the projection mapping has, you know, there are some, uh, some things that pro projection mapping looks a lot nicer <laughs> if you if you do it, especially over 3D objects and so on and so forth. And so I don't think that it's necessarily the, the replacement for all of that, uh, but it is something that has become cool and a lot of people are using it. And again, we went through a lot of hard years of, bad moray and horrible compression and all kinds of things to get to where we are now, which is that it does look a lot better. I mean, you're probably not going to see something like the volume for live events. I mean, you, you see some of it right now. I mean, they are using these types of LED walls for live events, but heavy multi-camera, the way you'd see them at a live venue uh, would not work because if you look at the way the camera moves, if you watch any of the behind the scenes from Mandalorian, watch that background and what's happening as the camera's moving to get the parallax and to, and to properly it's framing what's on the LED wall only for that camera. <laughs> so as the camera moves, you're seeing a square kind of move across and around behind them. And so that's it's not just static back there. So um, in, when we see it in a set, oftentimes and generally in um, in the in like on a stage in front of people, what you're generally seeing there is an, as a static LED wall that's representing something, and that can be it can show graphics, it can show uh, you know some, make it look like it is something. So those are a variety of things. But generally, if you're using multi-camera, it gets complicated because if you're matching that parallax, if you have only have one camera, it's easy. If you start asking, if you do multi-camera, let's say for 30 frames a second, a lot of times what they're doing is they're they're using 60 frames a second and both and you see this weird flutter because it's actually those cameras are getting different things for their frames um, and it's uh it's complex <laughs> so so anyway so i think that multi-camera is a little bit more complicated if you're going to try and move that background and so typically what 
you see a single camera for vo things like the volume and then more static things um, that might be in the background. And again, it's starting to become a lot more doable and I think we'll see more of it as we, as we move forward. Courtney? Yeah, the other th consideration is lighting, uh, you know, projection mapping, you gotta have, you gotta have control over the light, can't be done in an exterior event. Uh, that transitions from daylight to night uh, very easily. And an LED wall can, because they can adjust the brightness on the LED wall for daytime or nighttime and crank it down for nighttime so you're not blinding the people with the, uh, you know, 3,000 nits that you can do during, 10,000 nits that you can do during daytime so you can see an image in either day or night. So that's a consideration at an event too, is control over the lighting, uh, whether you use projection or an LED wall. Next question. Douglas Carmichael asking, with the success of cloud-based PC services like The Shadow, there's a link there, could you ever see Apple or a reseller offering an end-user-oriented Mac2Go service similar to Shadow? Yeah, it's hard to say no. They've got a heck of a research and development thing. I haven't seen Shadow, so I don't know specifically what this is about. But I do know that they've been morphing a lot of their products. And I'm thinking specifically about their moving Final Cut into the, the Final Cut for iPad. It seems like a lighter weight, very much virtual, virtualizable version of the software in that circumstance. Now, whether that portends anything for the future, I, I would imagine that all the services are keenly aware of what's happening in development on these computers are getting so fast they can do a lot of things they weren't able to do before and i think they're heading in that direction so we'll have to wait and see alex do you have additional thoughts on that we left we left poor poor bill hanging there i i, I forgot to put my name i was trying to find the right name and hadn't raised my hand yet <laughs> mac stadium does uh, something that's kind of like it um so that a lot of developers will use mac stadium to test things across lots of macs and so on and so forth so uh those and amazon has its own service that you can rent it's, it's a it is a um uh, you can you can log in. You just have to rent it by the day, and it's a relatively expensive thing. It's a lot more expensive. I think one day or two days of of um, the AWS charges are the same as Shadow <laughs> for the for the uh, for the whole month. So it's a little bit more expensive. So those those services are available. They're just a, a fair bit more expensive. Yeah, I, I actually, I, I should have thought of that because Mac Stadium has been on my uh, radar for quite a while. They have thousands of machines sitting there. And for the developers who need to virtualize, how would this run on different kinds of Macs and things like that? Great service. So, yeah. All right. Let's move on to the next question. From Gordon Lake in Los Angeles, California, Gordon asks, how much time should one set aside to learn Companion on a stream deck? Uh, Mitch Hill, what are your thoughts? Um, I've dabbled in it, and it's uh, kind of a learn-as-you-go thing. Um, if you choose to make it, if you want to go deep, obviously, it's going to take more time. But uh, I integrated... Mix Effect Pro into my uh, companion. I did it in five minutes, and I know nothing about it. No, oh, that's certainly positive, Alex. Yeah, I mean, I think that one of the things that'll shorten it is to find people here in in our community that are using companion, see if they'll jump into after hours with you and work work with you on it. Um, having somebody else, it's just a great cheat sheet to have somebody else who already knows how to do it, talk to you about it while you're doing it. There are some good videos, and obviously, it's not that complex to use but it's a lot faster to work with somebody to, on it. And we'll see if we can set up some more companion labs. I think we've had them in the past. Uh, we haven't done them recently, and we'll, we'll see what we can do there. Perfect. Next question. From Douglas Carmichael. Alex, you mentioned most of the U.S. uses a subscription service for content. Why haven't more services brought themselves under an umbrella like the Apple ID or Google account? Is it the percentage that Apple Google takes? Courtney has a thought about this. Courtney? Well, not only the percentage there, they each streaming service wants to keep uh, their own uh, residuals, in other words, their own subscription income uh, fixed. So they don't necessarily want to sell to aggregators. That's what they're getting away from. They're trying to escape the cable, uh, cable TV carriage fees uh, that they used to have to pay. Uh, and they're trying to get that subscription money directly uh, rather than having it aggregated. But I tell you, consumers are really getting kind of sick, I know I am, of having to pay, you know, one one good show I want to watch is on this streaming service, and another good show I want to watch is on that streaming service, and another good show I want to watch is on, you know, I used to be, I could get all those shows with one cable TV subscription. Now I got to subscribe to four different $10 a month subscriptions just to get the same shows that I was getting on a cable TV service. So I think Somebody is going to, at some point, do an aggregation. YouTube TV can do this to some extent. I have a subscription to that. 
but it's almost as expensive as cable was. Uh, they gathered together a lot of the, the cable channels that were on your standard cable service and put them up there for a monthly subscription fee. And they also make deals on like a combo of HBO Showtime and and uh, Cinemax, I think, for 30 bucks a month. So you add that onto your subscription. So they will aggregate those. And there are aggregation deals that you can get from different streaming services like Hulu and, and YouTube TV. But uh, hopefully there will be someone that's going to aggregate them together. But a sticking point in that has to do with all these contract negotiations that are going on right now with the actors, directors, producers, and uh, and writers. And they're going to have to completely upset their uh, change and make a paradigm shift in the way that they calculate uh, their income for that to work. Ow. Oh, excuse me, Alex. Yeah, I, I think that um, specifically to this, which is just using your Apple ID or Google account, um, I think that a lot of them want to make it harder for you to unsubscribe and want to make it, uh, you know, and want to manage that relationship directly with you. And um, and so this is, by the way, a great reason that a lot of us are very resistant to the idea that we would break up any of the stores, whether it's the Google Play Store or the Apple Store in any significant way, because, you know, our real concern is that is that we would then be forced to if we really wanted some, to subscribe to something outside that ecosystem, now we're giving them our data and we're giving them our money and we're not able to do it. Apple doesn't, by the way, I don't think they charge on Apple TV um, if you're using their their um, their login. They might, they might, because Netflix uh, wanted to bypass them for that. But but Netflix runs on, there's an app on Netflix there and then you have to log in somewhere else. But that, and I have to admit for a long time, I didn't do that. Like I would just not, sign up for the service, but I finally broke down. And that's the point is, is that you just, you have something that you want there. Um, so it, it'll be really interesting to see. I do think Apple has made the attempt, I believe, to try, try to engage people to be all under one thing. And so far it's been resisted. Chris Fenwick. I think it, this is like the ultimate math problem. I mean, Courtney, you said, you know, you, you subscribe to this for that and this for that. And all of a sudden you spend $10 a month times four. Well, that's cheaper than cable. That's cheaper than cable. And and yeah, it'd be great if your personal taste was, I only like shows that are on Max or whatever. And then you could just subscribe to one thing. I mean, ultimately, this is there's two different types of, of viewers, in my opinion. There's the people whose television is, you know, a, a, a white noise or an appliance that's just always on. And those people want to have cable TV. And there's a lot of those people still uh, in my family, uh, in our country. They, they just want a TV on all the time. And it's going to play the same home improvement shows or the same, you know, Naked and Afraid, whatever, on Sunday afternoons, which is always on in my house for some reason. Uh, and then there's the people that are very um, uh, directed and poignant about what they want to watch. Uh, and we're, we've gone through, you know, when you start bundling all those together, as Douglas's question asks here, you get back to where we were at uh, one giant, huge, enormous cable bill where you're n really not watching everything. Then we tr had Apple selling us one show at a time. People thought that was egregious or they didn't understand the benefit of that. That's still my favorite. Uh, and then you have the streaming bundles and then you gang those together and we're right back where we started from. It's ridiculous. Mitchell. I'm getting ready to dump uh, DirecTV in favor of Apple TV because it just does a great job of aggregating. And like all things Apple, it makes it simple. I mean, I get everything from uh, updates on my phone about, uh, let's see, there's a new episode of Strange New Worlds coming on on Paramount+. Plus. Um, it's nice to know that. And Apple does a great job of managing my subscription. So I don't mind a little extra money for that convenience. Uh, and Alex. YouTube's the big winner here <laughs> because YouTube TV, they're going to have football in the fall, like football, like all the football games in the fall. And then they have like football, <laughs> which is the biggest thing we're talking about in the second hour. But it's the it is one of the biggest viewer viewing um, uh, things that you get, whether it's, you know, and, and uh, so I think that the, the real problem is also we're at peak. The problem we're going to have as we go forward is we're kind of at peak content. Uh, I think the quality of the of the shows that we're starting to see come out and a lot of the streaming, they're just out of, they're out of writers, actually. They're out of people who can do this and they're still trying to produce them. And I just feel like the quality is starting to roll, roll out. And so I think you're going to, and the next generation is all watching YouTube.
you know, like, and so the thing is, is that I think that YouTube has is, is just been slowly grinding this forward. And um, between YouTube TV and YouTube, I think that the next generation is mostly a YouTube generation and probably less and less most of the other networks. Yeah, for me, it's been an interesting thing. And we were talking in the pre-show today about a James Garner and Jack Lemmon movie. And I thought, you know, I should watch that again. And I thought, how will I go find it? I now know the name of the thing. Which service? Where where, where would I even go? And for me, the combination of checking on Apple TV and checking on, I think Amazon Prime also tells you what other services something's on without having an, an aggregator TV guide or cable guide kind of program that tells you which If you're in your Apple TV and you, just, and you just push down the mic when you're in the general interface and just ask for the movie, it'll tell you what service it's on. Oh, will it? Okay. So, I, well, I've, I think I've seen a few cases where they didn't have Netflix. it. Maybe it's, it's not Netflix. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Fair enough. Anyway, um, let's go on to the next question. Doug Johnson has been patiently waiting. Uh, Doug is from Spanish Fork, Utah. I have a very few customers that ever ask for 4K for a live event streaming or even recording of said events. Do you ever see that changing? Mitch, take um, it away. Doug, it's, it's interesting. I don't get clients asking by uh, uh, for 4K, but I shoot it in 4K, uh, whether it's a live event or I'm posting because it gives you more options than posts. So if you offer uh, a a 1090, uh, a 1080 uh, video at the end, an H.264, and it's in 1080. They're perfectly happy to have that. And the fact that it's in 4K means that I can do all kinds of manipulation because invariably there's a problem. So uh, it's, gr it's great to start with 4K and end up with whatever works for them. Alex? Yeah, about 80% um, of my shows are 4K. <laughs> that's the that's the spec. So it just depends on, I think it depends on the market that you're in. Um, but we're, you know, constantly working in 4K. We sometimes will drop down to 1080p for some reason, but uh, most of the requests are, are for a 4K solution. So, so I think that it, it, and I'm glad that we built for a long time, we didn't say, oh, we're just going to buy 1080 equipment <laughs> because, because it, it, it was really easy for us to shift to 4K as needed. So, um, so I think that there are definitely clients out there looking for that. Um, but I do think that probably the vast majority of general use is probably still 1080p because it looks pretty good on a big screen. Next question. From Idris Hagai from Fairfax, Virginia. What is the best way to monitor network bandwidth status or performance for streaming live events to YouTube and or, and or other platforms? Alex. Typically, you want your router to have some of those. I mean, there's there are... Um, uh, there's a variety of, of analyzation tools, but what we usually use is simply our, you know, Meraki or a Ubiquiti router, and it's going to tell you what what the bandwidth is going in and out. And um, there's uh, SolarWinds is like the bigger version of that <laughs> that'll do it. They'll pay a lot of attention, but we've just used our routers, and that gives us a sense of it. If we see something, and we go and look at the router. We'll almost always, if it's on our end, we'll, we're going to see a pocket there. And next question. Paul Wallace in Austin, Texas, asking, can large language models infer causation from correlation? Ooh, deep question. Alex, give us some no. thoughts. L large language models don't know anything about what they're doing. <laughs> like, so, so they don't, they don't know what, they don't know what they're answering. They don't have any, there's not a, it, it's not really, a, it, when they say artificial intelligence, I think large language models is more accurate than artificial intelligence. They're not intelligent. They are putting things together, taking a whole bunch of things and they're, 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 they're not inferring anything. They're not thinking about anything. They're simply, it's, it just take out your phone and type in a word and then try to type and then see what it predicts for the next word. And, and then and then just write a sentence while you just follow along with that sentence that, that pops out there. That's what large language model does at scale. You know, like it's just it's just it's just filling. Oh, I think that that's the next word that would go in there um, based on looking at everything else. But it's not inferring anything. So we are very close to the changeover, and I'm just going to mention a couple of things that are coming up tomorrow on the show, the world of DMX lighting. That's going to be really fun. So if you're interested in that technology, uh, we'll be talking about what DMX is, how it works, uh, DMX over IP in the virtual world, and can you make a fixture with an Arduino? So those are the things for tomorrow. Saturday, don't forget we are in our summer series of Accessibility Saturdays. So tomorrow we're going to be talking, or Saturday we're going to be talking about mobile accessibility. So if you're interested in that, uh, it's going to focus on mo mobility disabilities and including topics and issues surrounding all sorts of mobility devices, such as wheelchairs, walkers, crutches, and things like that. So if you are interested in that space, 
please come by at the end of the week here and uh, check out Saturday's show. Sunday is introspection as usable uh, as usual. Sorry about that. Uh, Sunday is not archived on YouTube, so we have a little bit more of an exploratory feel to the show. So if you haven't been on Sunday, it, that is really a fun place to kind of more casually talk about everything that's going on here. All right, we're right at the top of the hour crossing over here. And so we are welcoming to the panel one of our guests, and I'm really looking forward to this. So if you've ever seen the initials TD and you weren't quite sure at the end of a big sports broadcast or something like that what that what that exactly meant, you are going to find out today. Uh, we have Brad Woodall here. And Brad, it's welcome. Great to see you here. How is your signal coming in? Hey, great. Uh, I think I see and hear you guys great. Absolutely. And you sound fabulous, too. So for those in the audience who might not know tech crew positions all that well, can you start us off by defining exactly what a TD is responsible for in a big show? So mostly uh, the, the bigger setup as well, uh, transmission, uh, switcher setup, uh, the, the obvious one, uh, but all, all things leaving the truck and kind of the final gatekeeper uh, of what is going to go out on program, uh, protecting a director from time to time at the last second that they might uh, they might give you a thank you for. Um, so, but, so you're but really hearing on last... comms what the director wants, and you're having to execute that and make it actually happen for the Yeah, audience. so we've got, uh, usually on a front bench, we'll have a director sitting right next to me, uh, and to their left, a producer. Director's really kind of handling all the live um, action of it, uh, all the cameras, the graphics, and everything. Uh, in a sports world, the uh, producer's handling uh, all things replay, uh, handling the announcers, and kind of the storytelling as to where the uh, broadcast is going. Uh, they'll kind of have a list of uh, storylines that they want to get in uh, and making sure that they're kind of leading the uh, announcers to those at certain points in the game where they feel that it's most appropriate. So for people who are listening might be interested in that and engaged with it, can you tell us a little bit about your journey? How did you get to be where you are today? So if we uh, back up about 30 years, uh, my hey, dad worked at an NBC affiliate in Springfield, Missouri, uh, he was there for 33 years, uh, around nine, 10 years old. They had a 40 foot box truck, remote truck. Uh, and I went on the road with him a lot, uh, and, uh, did a lot of basketball games in the Midwest, uh, and watched him kind of produce that show in college. That, uh, package that I watched him produce, uh, got transitioned to another broadcaster. Uh, and they actually brought me on to direct and TD the package. So my junior year, I have college. I was actually directing and TDing the show that I had watched him put together for 15 years. And uh, after that, graduated college and started uh, TDing uh, regional sports uh, in the Missouri, uh, kind of the whole Midwest area, and did that from about 2007 um, on up to probably 2015 or so. In uh, 2012, I worked uh, Olympics with NBC and I've worked them since Tokyo. Uh, and I, I mostly work with uh, NBC and CBS. A lot of the uh, freelance guys that uh, are on the remote level, we kind of have the networks that we lean towards. Uh, but we also, on a freelance side, we'll we'll go and work for other networks. That's not uncommon. Um, 2015 uh, did the first Kentucky Derby for me, and uh, 2022 did the Super Bowl pregame show as well. Uh, so. And uh, those are kind of the NBC ones, CBS, they do NFL with them, the Masters, March Madness, and PGA Golf. An, an impressive resume, to say the least. Uh, it looks like you have some slides that you want to show us. And can you kind of take us backstage on what you do? Yeah. So uh, if I can yell at the TD to go ahead and take the two box uh, that they normally take. Um, so you guys should see, um, I'm going to kind of start a wide picture with, and I'm using Thursday night uh, football as the example here. Uh, you guys should see a... a um, a picture of our compound is that correct we do yeah, yeah we so see. this was our first game in kansas city um we have seven mobile units on this on this show uh 10 total uh the extra ones are generator trucks ups trucks uh, and four follow trucks with that so on that left this, picture is the encampment yeah, of all the so, trucks producing so where show. we were our this was our main production truck um for uh where the producer director and graphics are uh, next to it is kind of where the um, the engine room for everything is, and audio is over there as well. Pre-game truck uh, is also in that in that compound as well. So uh, the fancy one here, that's our office truck, actually. Uh, it just happened to have the best wrap job uh, out of all of them. So 
Do you this judge is, them by yeah, how well they're yeah. wrapped? <laughs> well, the uh, the great thing about this one was is is uh, it had the calendar on it, so every week we could just check off how many games we had left. Uh, so we kind of <laughs> use that uh, as, as we went on. So here's the control room uh, of the uh, main production truck. Um, this is an HDR monitor wall. Uh, it's one of the biggest in a remote uh, in a remote setting, and it's 11 racks wide. I'm going to kind of go into detail uh, a little bit more uh, about this room. This is just kind of a panoramic view uh, of our first one here. And uh, like I said, 11 racks wide. So cameras are mostly all down in here for the director. Director sitting right here. Uh, the uh, producers over here. And all tape machines are are over in here as well. Graphics typically live right up around in here so that the uh, TD, I'm sorry, so that the director and the producer uh, can see them. I also have them right around in here. So. Is this kind of a standard layout that if you were this working is pretty, in a uh, this is the widest layout. It was actually okay. uh, when I when when we were in here, it was, it was kind of hard. Uh, Pierre, who I've been with for about 12 years now, I wasn't used to him being that far away. Uh, and it was uh, it was interesting. It was a bit of a change. Uh, just kind of changes your tune to the room. Uh, I, I typically listen to him uh, in my ear. Uh, I listen to the producer more in room noise. Uh so I'm, that's kind of how I juggle uh, uh, keeping track of both of them. This is them in the control room. Uh, this is our producer, Fred Gadelli, and then our uh, director, Pierre Musa. Uh, I've been with Pierre for about 11 seasons now. Um, so the relationship between the, the TD and director uh, is really important. Um, on shows like this, like, I'm really in his head. I know what he's thinking. If he mutes his mic in frustration... I know usually what it is. Uh, there, there's if he looks at me with a with a certain eye gesture or anything, it's just that relationship is almost um, it's almost indescribable and and how it evolves. Um, so body language in your world is kind of important to get an intent somebody. So that might be a yeah. difficulty if everybody went virtual entirely in yes. your kind of work. That was tough. We did do um, some virtual ones where uh, the the tech crew was on site. Uh, CBS did it and the uh, production crew wasn't and it was really weird uh yeah it, it was really weird you're sitting in this whole truck and it's just you cutting a show at the venue uh, and it was like an experience that we had never witnessed before so uh so our ad's back here as well we'll have a tech manager back in here so. uh and this Br is brad who is that sitting between you and the director uh What's that their... is <laughs> that is actually a guest uh it's okay. actually al michael's brother uh, the night that this picture was taken, he uh, was swinging by. Uh, he has a good relationship with Pierre, our director. So he actually, he is not normally there uh, and just happened to be there uh, when we took this picture. So CBS uh, used the Prime One truck for um, coverage of the Masters. Uh, I am not the main guy on the Masters. I happened to, I had to step in for about an hour in relief. Um, but this kind of gives you a little different perspective of a different show, they had four guys on the front row just because of how golf, uh, the the flow of it, there's so much tape playback and everything. Uh, so they have more guys helping out, uh, kind of driving that that story as well. That actually brings up a question. Is it important to know the sport that you're covering? Are the nuances critical to doing your job? Yeah, very much so. You know, the 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 naming uh, nomenclature for golf uh, is is significantly different for uh, football, for example, the the naming nomenclature in golf is tees, greens, flanks, um, and then uh, all the handheld cameras are by letters. Uh, so it is in sometimes the directors uh, have a tendency that you know eight green sounds like eighteen. Uh, so you they really have to be uh -huh. and 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 on a show as large as PJ Championships or the Masters or something, when you've got all those green cameras there. Uh, they really have to make sure that that communication is is paramount and knowing exactly where we're going. So uh, that's a uh, getting kind of back now into Thursday night. Uh, this is our camera breakdown uh, that shows you uh, all the cameras that we have on the show. Uh, we've got seven configured cameras, which are uh, first and ten lines. Uh, we've got three Ross virtual cameras, six 4K cameras on 13 super slow-mo cameras uh, on the show. 
The it seems machines, like such a big list. Is that something like, you know, a piano player doesn't think about the keys? Do you think about the list and that? Does it change much? Or do you just know what cameras are where after you've this one, this? Uh, this one, when you do it weekly, it's kind of ingrained in your head. Uh, mm -hmm. As I was going to talk about here in a minute, when you uh, when you have a show like this, uh, the the layout of, of my hands, uh, I cut everything, cameras one through nine, with my right hand. Uh, and I'll show you here in a second where those are. Everything else I cut with my left hand. Um, and because one through nine is where you're mostly going to a large majority of the time, that's what I end up cutting with my right hand. Uh, here's our tape machines. Uh, they're all uh, numbers, uh, which helps me uh, because I know that 52 is all the way down at the uh, left side. 99 is all the way down at the right side. So this is a little bit more breakdown of kind of my area. Uh, the, uh, monitor wall and stuff, um, all things transmission are kind of up around in here. Uh, these are the, uh, ME multi-view layouts. And, uh, down here is where it kind of can't, we had an extra rack in this truck cause it was so big. And I actually struggled with trying to find things to put there, uh, cause we had so much monitor wall space. Uh, comms that you guys talked about yesterday on the show, uh, some good questions there as well. Um, transmission routers and then monitor wall routers are up here. Uh, I've got a scope here as well, which was really paramount and, um, making sure our SDR and HDR quality that, uh, we were doing the right conversion on it for where we needed to be. Uh, just a little tighter view of that as well. Uh, again, transmission up in here. You mentioned HDR and SDR feeds. Or do you have to manage both of them simultaneously? We don't. Um, so basically, the entire show is produced in HDR. Uh, what we're really watching for is uh, in a graphic world, uh, our graphics are done in SDR. Uh, a few weeks ago when you had Jim Toten and uh, Mike Drazen on, that kind of explained a little bit of that process. Uh, the only things that I'm really looking at on a, uh, a SDR side is, is, did the graphics come up to HDR and did they get uh, back down to SDR because the show was actually left the truck in SDR? Uh, where did it, uh, was was there any color shift or colors like red and, and oranges can kind of, uh, some blues can start to do some funky things. So it's really just making sure that by the time it was in SDR, uh, we were still happy with the, with the end look of it. Uh, the, uh, one other thing I wanted to talk about too, uh, that's uh, started on Sunday night and is um, really difficult position uh, is what we call truck telly on the show. And uh truck telly is if you ever watch uh, Thursday night or Sunday night, and I think some of the others are starting to do it. A lot of times uh, that first or second replay angle will have a, a telestrator head of the player and, a, and an arrow going to it. Uh, that's all being done by a human being. Uh, it's one of the most difficult jobs because it's typically the first uh, first look or two of a replay that, that's coming in. So they have to route the tape machine into the telestrator, find the telly head, and then draw the arrow all within about three seconds in it, and it'd be ready to go uh, when the producer calls for it. So it's a very difficult job. Uh, it's, it's one I couldn't do, uh, and it's only handling, but it's just one small aspect uh, of the show. Uh, it's an aux panel. Uh, this is where I usually stash a bunch of promos, uh, billboards, and stuff like that. A lot of guys just uh, kind of use it. It's off to the side. Uh, don't touch it a lot. This is my main layout. Uh, this was I took this yesterday. I was up at the shop. Um, not perfect what I wanted to, um, but it kind of gives you an idea as to how things are laid out. Um, so I have ME3 down here on this K-frame switcher. I can determine which uh, rows are program, which rows are ME's, and where they are. So I do ME3 down here. I do ME2 up here, uh, which is where I do replays on. ME1's reserved for boxes, split screens, any kind of uh, suck back moves or anything like that. Uh, and I do program up here. I rarely touch program. Uh, the only time I ever touch program uh, is usually to put in a watermark uh, or if it's kind of an oddball situation that you've got to quickly slam to something, I'll take it. Every TD kind of lays their stuff out differently. One of the most difficult jobs to do is relief TD. Uh, because you have to slide in and be perfectly uh, in tune with where the other TD has everything set up. And it's not, 
it's not uh it's a creature of habit as to where your hands always land uh and it becomes a little difficult so uh, this is the last slide uh but earlier you were talking about uh just kind of layout and everything so this whole picture is is kind of this area right here blown up but um i'll keep like i said i cut cameras one through nine with my uh, uh right hand and then i'll do everything else uh down here with my left hand uh quick transitions that i need to get to rollouts that i need to get to quickly um it's kind of where the hand placement and it kind of always stays there as well that's that's great are you there great excellent I am, yeah. uh, okay we're going to move on to uh some of the panelists alex dive so, in there and you were talking about people sliding slide you you slide in for another td is it sounds like it's it really that whole switcher changes for every td as far as where they like to have things and where they like to put them they do uh it's uh i was trying to go back to the uh full screen layout of here so if if the uh you see this picture again so for example the golf guy he likes program down here uh and he cuts right. here so at that point now i'm reaching over uh, a bus when i'm usually used to keeping my hands right on the counter uh and i'm going to it, it uh, golf was the, one of the hardest is because there's so many things and all of a sudden they say, hey, you know, go to this random, you know, talent camera and you're just, I mean, you're really looking up and down like a keyboard yeah. kind of stuck sometimes uh, if you haven't done it. Once you start filling in for them more and more, uh, it all becomes second nature. Yeah. Uh, I do four different guys for the Masters. So I'm the relief guy for four guys all day long and all of them set it up completely different. All of them call things <laughs> different. And it, and you're just sitting there and you just, I do my hour and I come back and I do relief breaks and I, yeah. I just say, get back in the chair. I'm moving on to the next one. Right. Can wow. you reconfigure for the preference that you have, or do you have to work on their preference? Uh, on something like that, it's best to just use theirs um, because they've laid it out for, you know, if I came in, I, I, first of all, we're, we're doing this basically as you're on the air. So, I mean, it's basically unplug a headset jack, uh, plug your headset in, and while golf is continuing to be cut, slide out of the chair and sit down and are you good to go? Uh, so it's a it's a pretty quick swap. Um, so there's no time to reconfigure no time anything. That, yeah. You really just start continue cutting like nothing happened. And then which which uh, that's a Grass Valley switcher? Yeah, Grass Valley K-Frame, yeah. Pretty mm -hmm. standard in a remote um, truck world. Uh, you'll see a couple uh, with Sony's, Ross's uh, floating around in some smaller trucks as well. Uh, this is basically pretty much a standard for all remote large sports trucks. Now, are, are all those monitors just regular monitors just turned vertically? Are they, are they something special or are they, are they? Uh, Bolins, they're not even vertical. Bolins. Uh, oh, they're not vertical, okay. No, they are, some reason they're I, horizontal. Oh, for some uh, reason I looked at them and I saw, well, that may, nope. so those are just cut, those are just breaks between them. Yep, yeah, got so uh, like what you see right now is there's, uh, these are nine boxes. Uh, so oh, got it, okay. Give, give you a, 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 a frame of reference. Yeah, uh, yeah. So like, here's a, here's a break, here's a break, uh, here's a break. Uh, yeah. So yeah, no, they're all horizontal. Uh, Bolins, this was one of the first uh, H full ATR monitor oh, walls, yeah, uh, which was amazing. You know, I've, I've been doing ATR since uh, NBC started testing it around 2017. And we struggled because of all the monitors walls were still in SDR. Yeah. So uh, I just kind of got used to like, all right, well, that doesn't look right. I had one good ATR monitor up next to me. Right. I could see what it was going out. Our director would say, video, I trust you. You know, if it looks good here, it looks bad off my monitor, but I, I got to trust you. Yeah. I'll leave it here. That's starting to change as some new trucks are getting online. Some are being retrofitted to have HDR monitors as well. You find you have a better tan now. The yeah, HDR. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I did one show a few, uh, about a year ago, and they didn't flop them over from, uh, they left them in, in HDR. And it was it was March Madness, and I did those four games. And, and about halfway through the day, I was like, why do I feel like I'm being blinded? <laughs> this monitor wall is just so bright in my face. Yeah. And yeah. I finally realized at the end of the night, they had all the monitors still in ACR. And I was like, oh, well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Being a monitor wall right or now. a tanning booth. Yeah. Do, you ever find, so do you ever find yourself having to fill in for the director? Like the director needs a moment and you just start cutting the show or is it? Is it? You do. It doesn't happen on um, it uh, something like Thursday or, or a, a CBS Sunday. or five. It, it doesn't happen on much of that. Um, there are some times... Um, on some smaller shows uh where you know yeah you're you're basically hey i got this for a minute um so, some all you know longer in the day type things you right. know hey I, you know step aside for two seconds i i was 
doing some streaming for track and field the other day. We were streaming all the field events all day long. I was directing. I had a good relationship with the TD. I was like, hey, you know, cut these two cameras for a little bit. You know, I'll be back in 30 minutes or so. And same thing. I ended up cutting some stuff for him as well. So, yeah, yeah they're, they're, you do see a little bit of that as well. And, and most pe people who are TDs are, you know, are have been directors. Like you've been a director for a lot of these things as well as a TD. I mean, at this at this level, right? So you kind of know the... You, you, yeah, you, for some stuff, you know, on certainly not on on NFL. I, the 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 difference. I'm more of a tech guy. I, I love mm -hmm. things tech. Uh, I I've enjoyed the directing just because it's a it's a new seat uh, and and different opportunities. On shows this big, it's too much deep into the storylines of stuff that just isn't my cup of tea. Yeah. Um. So that's why I love TDing larger ones. Um. And the smaller ones where there's not so much storytelling involved in it. Uh, it's just a sport. Those are the ones I've enjoyed directing more so. How often do you see issues like during the game? Like there's a camera issue. There's a other, you know, some kind of something that you have to kind of work around as, you know, as the team on the ground. On on one as big as Thursday, it's not so much about you're constantly seeing issues, but it's about a solution for the split second that you see the issue. Right. Uh, for example, one of the, one of the like, death con situations next to me is the uh configured cameras the sports media configured cameras that's the first and 10 line if one of those servers you know takes any kind of a hiccup uh you know i reach over and i route the clean version of that camera to everywhere so it it routes it to the in front of the director it routes it coming into the switcher and everything so as i can tell you you're talking take, about the, the first and 10 you're talking about the one with the lines right yeah so the, the yellow line the line of scrimmage and the, and the yellow line it'll have the down and distance there as well uh so uh, we had one time that it took a hiccup. Uh, and so, you know, you, you, I basically slammed over to that, routed the clean version in front of our director and to me worked on the, I've, you know, I then hit a help button on, uh, to the engineers from, to help me like, Hey, you guys go address this issue and come back and tell me when it's good that I can put it in. We're continuing to cut a 25 camera show. I can't go deal with, you know, why this is what the issue is. There's an entire team of people making sure that all those are coming in clean to us. Fascinating. And we have a ton of questions uh, packing up here. First, Courtney has a couple of comments. Courtney? I think you may have answered it. My question was the first, the, the single digit uh, uh, cameras you had listed as configured. And I guess, so that means that they're tracked for overlay graphics then. Is that what that means? Yeah. So the, the configured cameras can do, uh, I just popped the, um, I just popped a camera breakdown back up uh, on the screen here. Uh, so yeah, the configured cameras, uh, like I said, seven of them, and it's all things um, first and 10. So for example, camera 15 is a configured camera as well. It's a slash camera. Uh, it's one that you're mostly only going to see in replays, uh, but that's so that when that camera is replayed, uh, you have, you're able to see the um, down and distance mm -hmm. on, on that version of it. You're not going to see that uh, on the program cut. It's mostly for replay. Nice. Good. All right. Let's dive into our questions. Mitch. First in from Peter Buck in San Francisco, California. Interested in the setup process. How long does it take from when the truck arrives at a location until the broadcast can start? What key factors need to be managed? Brad, take it. So, so our trucks uh, usually arrive, uh, they start parking around Monday morning for a Thursday game. Uh, the engineers usually travel in uh, Monday mornings. Uh, they're there by after lunch. Uh, they'll start uh, expand most all these trucks are expando trucks um so they'll start uh, getting power to those parking them in some stadiums can be an issue in itself especially with like i said with our seven truck compound uh a lot of the stadiums roll their eyes when we roll into town uh with this 14 truck traveling circus that we have so uh they'll start showing up around monday uh, i travel monday nights uh, and i show up uh, tuesday morning uh, we spend most of tuesday our pregame is on site and uh, that's a whole separate truck uh, set up, main, same pieces of equipment. Um, but uh, Tuesday is usually spent as kind of a compound faxing between um, all truck to truck stuff. We'll also do our initial transmission checks uh, as, they, as those start coming up uh, by Tuesday afternoon. Uh, Wednesday uh, is a giant day of just checking check lists. Uh, Later in the day, we'll do a tape fax and a camera fax. Earlier in the morning, we do more transmission faxes um, as well. Uh, and then uh, later in the afternoon, sometimes our producer and director will uh, come over uh, just uh, if they have some questions, if it's a stadium we haven't been to in a while. 
Uh, there's sometimes that I don't see those guys until Thursday at noon when they show up. Um, and it's, you know, they're ready to go. They walk in the truck and then we start doing a full blown, uh, rehearsal all afternoon long. Uh, it usually runs about two hours. Uh, we'll take a lunch and then come back. And by that time we do another transmission check, which is our final transmission check-in. And, uh, at that point, uh, by about five thirty, six o'clock in the evening, uh, we're pretty much ready to go. Alex, you had a comment? And be, and when you're doing that, is is before that? Is that is that when you kind of do the facts? You know, the camera facts. Is that a is that still something that happens? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I do one uh, Thursday. Uh, Wednesday's mostly all tech facts. Um, Thursday, um, Fred and Pierre do a a production facts, which is an hour and a half long. Uh, the most structured, regimented thing you have ever seen. Uh, when Production fact starts at 1.30. It does not start at 1.29.30. And it does not start at 1.30.30. It starts at 1.30. Uh, and basically countdown to it. Within that, that is kind of the everyone is in a seat. Everybody starts talking on comps. He'll talk individually to all the tape people. Director will talk individually to all the camera people. Can you hear me? Bring my noise up. This guy's a little too soft. This guy's a little too loud. Kind of what you guys were talking about in comms yesterday. Um, and we will run through all the kind of tech things and rehearse it. It's the same thing every week. It becomes so ingrained in you that, uh, it, when you do it live, it, it's almost second nature to do something. Um, and then any kind of, uh, if we do have kind of a nuance, if, if there's some extra piece that we're doing storyline wise, uh, that's the time that we'll rehearse that as well. And and this is, this is also where you have, you know, you're not just like making sure the camera is getting there, but it's running the cameras through their paces, right? To, to make sure that I want you to zoom in to the, do the things that you're going to do on the field. Right. And I want to make sure that they, everything lines up, right? Right. One interesting thing on the, for the Super Bowl, um, Fred actually does a scrimmage game. Uh, they get, uh, this happens, I think on, uh, I think it happened on Friday uh, of the last Super Bowl. Uh, they get two teams out there. They've got a, one of the guys that's worked with us for a while. He's, he is a football coach. Uh, he's out there directing teams and and they they did everything from the tunnel walkouts all the way basically to the end of the game. They were looking at every camera angle. Was there any blockage? Uh were you know, were were any fans potentially going to be in any kind of a replay angle um that would have that would have blocked a however important of a replay that it could be. Mitch, you had a question for Brad? Yeah, Brad, thanks for being here. At what point do they paint the cameras uh during your facts? So we do a, a on Wednesday night. Uh, we would stick around usually about the times uh, sun the sun would start setting because we're we are an evening game. So we would wait until those went down. We turn the lights on in the stadium, uh, and that was uh, the video room's kind of first opportunity to see that stadium. Uh, and uh, we would usually just get a couple people out throwing a football, checking all the super modes, are the are the phases uh, all in line into the EVS machine that they're going into. And uh, they would get a lot of the painting in there. Uh, one of the ones that uh, takes a little bit more time on our show is is the LED wall that we have in the booth uh, behind the talent. Uh, it's a funky way of HDR to SDR to SDR and back around. Um, but then making sure that if I put a live image in that video wall, uh, that it was painted correctly as well. All right, let's go to the next question. Tommy Shands from St. Paul, Minnesota asks, to what extent is the Skycam directed, and is there a dedicated director for that? Uh, no dedicated director. Uh, they're directed really no more than any other camera is. Um, there is a the show does have a framing manual uh, that's about fifty pages long uh, for that that kind of breaks down every scenario for each camera. We have the same guys pretty much every week, so um, they know the show, they know their responsibilities. Um, Skycam, it, it might be hey, swing over and get me something coming in and out of a break, uh, but you know, over the play and everything, they have all of their assignments uh, and it's not directed too much other than, hey, stay with a guy or swing over and get another guy. Uh, no more than any other camera, really. Next question. Jonas Donald from Stuttgart, Germany, asks, uh, what are the most common issues and problems you get to solve? Oh, uh, I don't solve many of them. I just ask people to solve them for me. Uh, I got a great oh, team of engineers. Oh, we don't believe that. <laughs> I got a great team of engineers. I am not the smartest guy in the truck by any means. Uh, I've got some great engineers. Um, uh, the one that's next to me uh, most of the time, 
uh, has a little bit of TD experience, uh, but but really focuses on the engineering um, and is good. And I will ask him to do some kind of convoluted setups or or router salvos or something. And he'll say, why are you doing this? And I'll tell him and he'll say, all right, you know, that kind of makes sense. So um, really just, I would say also having a, a keen eye of everything. Like I'm snooping on everybody all at the same time. I've got the tech manager behind me. If she starts mumbling about somebody's having a transmission issue or she sees a hiccup or there's something going on, uh, I that usually kind of starts percolating in my mind. Uh, and then if if I feel like it needs to get to our director, I'll lean over and tell him. Or if something went away, I tell him. I'll tell him when it's back. Uh, he won't take anything until I've basically given him the okay if it was bad that it's good again. And I'm not doing that. I'm not taking it until somebody's told me that it's good to go as well. Brad, how did you learn to manage your emotions? I mean, you were describing, uh, oh, there's something wrong. I have to fix this and I have to fix this in two seconds if I'm going to make this professional and work for everybody. When you were starting out, was there a panic piece? And how did you manage, you know, keeping cool when so much is on the line? Oh, there was. I mean, early in my career, there were some there were some sports regional shows that I didn't know if we were going to get on the air in 30 minutes. Um and and you're you're really stressing it a lot. I, I've grown up in this environment. If I had to do anything else other than remote television, I don't even know what it would be. Uh, I think it's just a comfort factor uh, with being around it for so long as well. Next question. From Tommy Shantz in St. Paul, Minnesota. Tommy wants to know, are there any PTZ cameras in the mix? And if so, how many and are they all controlled on site? Uh, there are. Uh, if uh, I've still got the camera breakdown list uh, up uh, if you go back to that. Uh, our PTZ cameras are uh, 13 and 14, our robo cameras, which those are the ones that are over the goalpost. I'm um, set back just a touch. Uh, the booth camera, uh, what else is? Oh, there are um, uh, 4K cameras that are on the sidelines. Uh, so the uh, the near side and the far side looking all the way down. And they're 4K in the fact that I think I just uh, told my camera to do an auto when I was using my hands there. Um they will go down the sidelines and then um they're also on the goal lines as well so they can they can they're doing the framing of that in tape so the camera stays wide uh and then if there's a play on a goal line the tape operator is actually framing that shot because the operator just stayed full wide to see everything hey i see 43 is a jib how big is that down there how, did, how big uh, a jib do you 30, need to cover 30 30ish feet so he's up feet? um so on, I, I did Notre Dame uh, for about 10 or 11 seasons um, with this crew as well. Uh, that one we had down on the field uh, over the student section. This jib is Ross configured. Uh, it's kind of up and in the stands and uh, is what, if you see kind of the wide virtual graphics uh, that come in, that's a, the jib camera. So he's he's kind of bored from uh, being down on the field covering action to now just a up wide, wide shot. Uh, but He's doing all right. Nice. Next question. From Bo Cordell in Charleston, South Carolina. Bo asks, how do you organize your Emmys and keyers for a football game? Uh, I kind of went through that a little bit. Uh, like I said, every guy is different. Um, but I keep, uh, like I said, I keep cameras down on ME3, uh, closest to me, tape machines. Um, th this is the largest, uh, longest string of tape machines uh, that I have to deal with on this show. Uh, it takes up the entire ME2 bank. Um, but, uh, Emmy cameras are down in front of me, tape machines above that. And then, uh, anything split screens, two boxes and all that kind of stuff is above that. Next question. It's cool. Oh, Paul Wallace from Austin, Texas asking, what are the highlights of your, uh, London, Sochi and Rio Olympics? Did anything happen in these and that you're totally didn't expect that called for above average technical expertise? Uh, no, London was a great experience. I was on the flash unit. We were actually on a truck that uh, went around and popped around. Uh, I actually had a really fun, great uh, London experience. Uh, really, the rest of them just kind of come down to logistics of the organizing Olympic Committee. Um, Rio was not quite so organized. Um, uh, Pyeongchang was, uh, was very organized in uh, South Korea. Uh, it was uh, a it was a really fun Olympics uh, as well, and so she kind of fell in the in the middle of that kind of organized. But it all comes down to what the host organizing committee uh, has done. 
When you're doing something like the Olympics, it has so many venues and they're so far spread. Are there any special challenges of dealing with so many remotes coming in? From you know, I, I do just a venue uh, at the Olympics. Oh. So for, for, for us, it's just like uh, being almost like any other remote. Uh, we were in we were in trucks. Uh, n- most of them, uh, Rio um, and Co- South Korea, the trucks were U.S. based trucks. Uh, they floated them over. Uh, so we that you know i was they were trucks i'd worked in before very familiar with them the engineers were american engineers uh our sochi one was uh from ireland um so still great truck laid out differently uh made some adaptions and um worked with uh the irish engineers who were great uh just a little different style of doing it interesting alex you had a thought how long are you there before the shows before the games start I go usually about 10 days before our first event. Uh, I've for 14 and 16, I did closing ceremonies as well. So I do, I did uh, figure skating uh, for winter and gymnastics in the summer. Uh, and those started early. Uh, and then I would stay and do closing ceremonies as well for two of them, uh, three of them. And uh, so I would come back. Uh, the last one for Tokyo, I didn't do closing. So I was, I was back before closing uh, even aired in the States. Next question. Eduardo Augustine in Panama. What's the story behind the celebration cam, and how do you orchestrate that process to DD, TD touchdowns and celebrations? Does the cam operator sell you the shot? Uh, so sometimes our uh, sometimes our uh, we we do have a uh, steady cam down there. Sometimes they will uh, say, "Hey, you know, uh, uh, sorry, I'm just trying to fix my auto tracking here because it's really annoying me." Interesting um, shot. <laughs> <laughs> it is swinging over there pretty good. Waiting um, for a graphic to come up. I know, you. right? Yeah, I was about to do an over-the-shoulder shot of myself here. Uh, it's got a mind of its own. Um, so the... Uh, I don't even know what it's focused on here. Uh, you're going to have to repeat the question. You're, oh, go uh, ahead. No Mitch. problem. What's the story behind the celebration cam, and how do you orchestrate that process to so, TD yeah, so touchdowns? We do have a, um, so we do have a... Steady cam on there. A lot of times, some, sometimes he'll pop up and say, "Hey, I got a, you know, I got a good shot," um, just so that that uh, Pierre will try to to, to take him uh, and just to point it out. But um, man, I am really getting off here. Uh, I love this. This is <laughs> outstanding. <laughs> uh, I'm chasing it. Uh, they'll sell him a little bit uh, as well. The content is still fabulous, so don't worry about it. Let's go to the next question. Question coming in from Douglas Carmichael. Um, what advantages does the grass K-frame platform bring that others in its class, Ross and et cetera, don't have? I don't know that it brings anything extra, just familiarity. Uh, it's it's just kind of what's been the standard for a long time. Um, there are features between uh, the three that you're really going to, four that you're going to kind of see, uh, grass, Sony, uh, Ross, uh, the Kahuna that was purchased by Grass. Um, it's hard to say any kind of major advantage. Really, just the operator familiarity, and um, I, I would I would pretty much just say you're not going to find many remote TDs who are going to want to go into a Sony uh, truck world and um, and want a TD a show, especially if it's a same day show up and I got to be ready to go by the end of the day. Uh, it's just going to be a lot more stressful on the day. You can tell you're a technical director. You see a problem with the shot. You're going to fix it regardless. Oh, yeah. oh, <laughs> what yeah. else is going on? This is great. Next question. Bo Cordell in Charleston, South Carolina, weighs in with, what is a three-channel wipe and how does it work? Uh, I'm going to share a separate screen here to show you guys. Um, so basically what's happening is, is the uh, replay move. Uh, has two travel mats. Uh, it has a, a primary mat and then a travel mat with it as well. Uh, uh, so you guys should, I've got a game uh, called up here. You guys should be able to see that. I don't know if we see it right now. I don't think I'm not see seeing it yet. Hang on. There we go. We see it now. There, okay. there cool. it is. So the, this was a, an off air game record here. Let me see if I can find a point where there was a replay. So this is, if you see right here, um, as this starts to open up, um, 
there if you see how on the sides of the screen i'm still on kind of the camera cutting me three uh and then revealing is starting to be the replay what's happening is is the second mat of that is um causing is basically opening up to the replay the outs a little better um to show here i'll let this play uh and and you'll be able to see Uh, telestrators. I don't think we talked about telestrators, but uh, just a simple key. I was going to say good defense, but not at the end. <laughs> <laughs> this was actually one of the uh, here. So here's this is actually one of the hardest. Let me take a step and talk about the HDR stuff for a little bit. Uh, this was probably one of our hardest HDR games because all of our graphics are done in SDR. They go up to HDR, and then the overall, the final product is is delivered in SDR. So when you had colors like this orange and this red um, for Washington and Chicago in this game, it was it was one of the ones that we had to watch the colors um, the most. So here's a prime example of this um, two-channel replay move. So essentially what's happening is, is the replay of me is being keyed with the secondary mat. And that's kind of how you get that um, effect of where it's full on the replay and then the entire uh, replay of me is being sucked back uh, to program. So that's what takes two mats on that. Great. Next question. From Peter Belbin in Houston, Texas. Are there any features or capabilities you'd like the switcher makers to add to future products or updates? Uh there are, uh, you know, more more MEs, more keyers, uh, more of everything, uh, really. Uh, the one interesting thing on this is the this K frame was built. We didn't do the show in 4K, um, but I would have been the the truck would have been 4K capable. Uh, I believe had they wanted to do it, that would have been insanely ambitious to do for the first season um, with all this. So uh, they did not do that, but it is capable of it. Alex, yeah, I thought. A lot of people when they first when we first start talking about MEs and uh, they talk about well how why would you need more than one when you say <laughs> you want more MEs on that on that grass what would you do with them like if if you had more MEs because that one has uh, is, you showed us four right that's got four yeah MEs. so the so like what the the alt feeds that we were doing um you know you're you're really only kind of able to give a, a variation or two of of program so if I give them a feed that doesn't have graphics that has all the replays. Uh, and it doesn't have like the telestrator. Well, the, the problem is they say, well, that's great, but we would like a version that has all this with the bug. Uh, and then somebody else comes along and says, well, we don't want the bug, but we want fonts. Uh, and then like, and when you say COVID, alt feeds, these are for others, other clients. That, no, they were, they were so alternate. So on Amazon, they did alternate streams um, right. for Thursday night. They had prime numbers. Um, they had a show called The Shop. Um, and then they had one called Dude Perfect, which was a kind of a trick shot type show. Um, but they, those guys were taking a variation of my program, uh, and then adding and supplementing and coming into it when they wanted to. Um, so they, uh, I had to create an alternate feed for them, um, during COVID with hockey, uh, what was happening with the Canadians were wanting, it, there was only one feed being produced at some games. The Canadians didn't want the rollouts, uh, you know, they, they would want replays and they would want their replay move. Um, and so all of a sudden you find yourself building a show for three or four or five people and you can't even monitor those during the show. And then somebody says, oh, well, you know, you, you programmed all these in an hour um, and you didn't have time to check every scenario that you ran into. And so they'd say, oh, well, when you went to this rollout, we got black or it actually went to the rollout or it cut to another camera and you just didn't have time to fax all that and check it out. Nice. Next question. Douglas Carmichael asks, uh, when you say tape machine, is it basically an EVS server nowadays? Yeah, all, all EVS uh, servers. Uh, we have, uh, there's two others that are kind of floating around in remote truck world right now. Um, so the 4K stuff were Sony servers and the um, CBS uses Hawkeye as well, which is actually purchased by Sony. Um, really for golf is where it excels. Um, but the uh, a lot of the operators are from home. Uh, and all they have to have is a, is a decent internet connection that is uh, communicating with the frame that is on site. Next question. Bo Cordell, Charleston, South Carolina. How long have you been in the office hours community? Uh, Bo sucked me into it. Uh, <laughs> thanks, Bo. Thank you, Bo. Uh, cost, ah, he's probably cost me a couple hundred bucks for sure. Um, 
But uh, I like that around. Well, last fall, a uh, guy came out to our Seattle game uh, and checked the trucks out as well. So uh, you've kind of got a little bit of a Thursday night fan club. There's a small group of us that are a little bit of a fan club to the show. Well, we're honored because it's it's <laughs> so fascinating to get these looks by the scene. Let's skip to the next question. Douglas Carmichael's back. Uh, when you define your panel layout, do you do it on the panel itself or via an app or web page? Uh, it's a menu page. Um, there's a, a GUI that's on the, uh, it was on that uh, rack uh, next to me. Uh, so that's all done uh, menu driven. Next question. Gordon Lake in Los Angeles, California. Can you talk about why it takes 14 trucks to do a game? <laughs> the big well, questions. They they want to cut it down to uh they like to cut a couple off. Uh there's just so many things. Uh for example, the uh they call the pregame set uh the A word that I don't want to say in my house because I don't want it to fire something off. Uh, but they call the the pregame show uh desk that uh the A word. And that desk alone takes up, I think almost half of a 53 foot semi um follow truck. Uh so we've got uh two uh cart, we've got two cart cams that are both dual carts. Um, so those have to get loaded on, uh, just all the stuff, uh, that comes along with supporting a show of that size. I, I, you probably don't know cause you probably don't travel with it, but I got to know, what is it like when that many trucks pull into a truck stop? Along the uh, yeah, it's it just overwhelming? You know, the guys, I, I think, uh, I haven't paid much attention to a Sunday night schedule. Uh, ours is not bad. Uh, but there's some years where you just get, you know, San Francisco to New York, to see and it's this is all the same trucks every week on on shows uh most of the uh, networks a shows and b shows they stick with that show so you know their games like i said seattle oh we're back in new york oh well now we're in la and now we're in baltimore and uh, you know halfway through the season these guys almost need a new set of tires uh on the trucks and, and the drivers are double teaming uh on cross-country stuff like this yeah i don't think people understand how much logistics that's yeah. amazing alex you had a thought so pretty much for those that they're they're on the road again at Friday or Saturday, right? To get to because they're loading into the next one on Monday. Yeah, and so you know Sunday night has it the kind of the hardest too at the beginning of the season. They'll do Thursday and Sunday, and then right. Thanksgiving week, which is changed. Uh, now they're doing it again this year, Thursday to Sunday as well. So they'll try to do a Green Bay to Pittsburgh or whatever. But right. I mean, they are packing up, um, and, and you hope that they're there, uh, ready to start working in on Saturday morning. We can cram everything into a day uh if we need to once we're kind of further into the season um uh, but but everyone's really busting to, to try to get everything done in a day if you have to are there some stadiums to take to, oh go ahead go ahead are Alex. there some stadiums that are easier or, or harder to to load into yeah like uh i know one for uh our size cincinnati is difficult to park in that the, it's just the the confines of the parking area are, are really tight um so some of them are just more logistical or, or mm -hmm. like, ah, oh, this, you know, this place, camera 15, that's a slash. The position's not quite as good in this stadium versus this stadium. Uh, and it's amazing, even with brand new stadiums now, they still don't have it perfect. You're like, you know, there'll be something blocking or you we really didn't talk else. to you about it. Like I, you always oh, think yeah. about like, why don't they talk to the folks that are going to oh, use yeah. this all the time? They're like, know, Oh, we put all this into computer models and spit it all out. And you're like, well, you didn't see this poll that was going to be here, you know, when the, <laughs> when they were, the guys were framing the building. So. Well, that was my, how long does it take from the time the trucks pull up to a stadium to actually connect everything and, and get to the point where you can do some work? About half a day, uh, about half a day on Thursday. Um, some are, you know, uh, your smaller show, maybe two hours. Um, again, it really depends on just where you are, the logistics of it. Um, there's always a longstanding joke in the industry that you just look for the trash dumpsters and, you know, that's where we're working. Uh, so if you walk into a new stadium, just find the trash dumpsters and that's where we're headed. Um, I would imagine it strikes any, a lot faster. Anywhere, yeah, anywhere from an hour to um, maybe to about half a day on something as big as Thursday or Sunday. Mitch has a follow-up. Mitch? Yeah, I, I know it's one of my questions coming up, but why the trash dumpsters? Because everywhere I've ever gone, I've hopped on a truck, there's a dumpster right outside the door. What's up with that? Well, that's where that's where the uh, the service entrance is, basically, uh, is, is pretty much why it always is. There's a girl in our industry that, in Kansas City that had a great, she did a, a calendar that was dumpsters I have known. Uh, she did a 12-month calendar. It's a great calendar. 
<laughs> it's a but yeah, it's a twelve month calendar, and every month you get a different picture of the trash dumpsters. I, I was told that part of it is egress for the for the tra- for the garbage trucks, you know, because it's it's big wide open area that they yeah. that they can get in and out. Um, that, yeah. that turns out to be the thing. Yeah. Next question. Next one in from Douglas Carmichael again. What changes and issues have you encountered with the move to SMPTE twenty one ten from SDI? Hmm. Ooh. Uh, three weeks of one of the longest setups. So our truck for Thursday is, is all IP based. Um, lip sync was probably the, um, the biggest challenge that we faced, um, because, uh, we had an Everts router in, uh, on prime one's truck, um, the way that they handle audio, um, and r- routing audio, uh, that was a huge, uh, kind of obstacle, uh, to overcome, uh, dealing with the delays and everything. So we're, we're actually kind of, putting the we're lining the uh audio and video up right as it's leaving the truck on the transmission router um so we would run valid through the audio console and the switcher and then line it up you're then reading the output of the tx router um and then lining that up and then that's ultimately what leaves the truck let's go to the next question Bo cordell in charleston south carolina do you use a foot pedal for anything during a show I do. A lot of guys use it for uh, intercom. Uh, so it'll be like a, um, uh, whoever last called you. Uh, so you don't have to reach over and hit your comms panel. I use mine to disable my GPI trigger. So when I preset a tape machine, um, this, a lot of guys do this it's fairly common. Uh, when I preset a tape machine, it'll turn a GPI or a, a trigger on for the machine. Uh, and if I don't want to trigger that machine, when I go to it, I'll turn it off with the foot pedal. Let's go to the next question. J.J. McKenna is from San Rafael, California. While you use Word Remote, how frequently did you do work remote to the facility? For example, Mickey is in the Philippines working as our remote A1. It's, uh, I, I think we're kind of still, we're still trying to figure it out a little bit. Um, the They do do some remote uh, mixing and stuff. Uh, it's we're struggling to find where we want to take it. COVID pushed us there. It pushed us really far ahead. And I think we're still trying to find a balance of what do we want on site? What can be done remotely? And it's still kind of sorting itself out. Well, it seems like you're so teamwork based that, that, you know, you're so integrated from everything I'm hearing. It's like, it, body it really is. Everything. And the thing, you know, going, going back to, you know, earlier, on some regional sports stuff, there were sometimes you, a director would walk in and and that was the first time you met him. Um, after you started doing them for a while, you start seeing some of the same guys. Um, but you, you could you could meet somebody at noon, uh, build your show for a couple hours, take a lunch break and come back and have to be on somewhat of the same page with this person uh, for a for their evening broadcast, uh, whatever sporting event it was for that night. So you start to see the same guys, but same lingo kind of exists, but there's also sometimes you just got a couple of men. It was just like, this is a great person. We just don't gel together and you just kind of get through the evening uh, and move on. Next question. Bo Cordell from Charleston, South Carolina, Carolina is back. Uh, can you explain the use of GPI triggers for tape machines? Uh, GPI triggers basically firing a machine um, before it's, it's me rolling the machine. Um, so it's done one of two ways with a, uh, just a simple GPI contact closure, uh, or machine control, which is, uh, either more of a ethernet based or serial based, uh, communication, but it's me rolling a tape machine, um, on uh, a lot of front ends and stuff that you'll see on shows, um, because they're so tight, uh, it's best if, uh, the TD rolls and then takes them as well. Next question. Mickey Makachor in the Philippines asking, TD and EIC, where can responsibilities overlap and what responsibilities have a hard delegation? I don't know that there's anything that's a hard delegation. It's just more of of working uh, together. Uh, Sometimes you get guys that are, you know, uh, hey, what do you need? I'll I'll do the very basics and and you're there. Uh, And if if it's a truck that you're not very familiar with, you kind of just struggle through the day trying to find where everything is. Uh, and then there's some where it's, it's great. Uh, it's a great relationship. I rely on them for everything. Um, from some of the trucks I can do some of the monitor wall routing, but you know, monitor wall routing labeling, uh, if, if a feed's not coming into me in the right format, if it's, if it's not coming to me right at all, uh, we rely on those guys a ton. 
Next question. Doug Johnson from Spanish Fork, Utah. How do you always or do you always power the trucks with the generator or do you also pull power from the stadiums? Each each show is a little different. Sometimes what they're uh, doing is, is they're taking um, uh, on Thursday. We do all generator. Uh, some shows will just plug directly into the house. Uh, some will plug into the house, run through a UPS, and then there's a generator on the side that's not running. Sometimes they'll pull a generator up pull the cables to it uh you're plugged into the building all day long and it would be a short turnaround to fire that up uh each uh each network kind of has their policies and it also kind of depends on the level of the show and if you are carrying the network for that time slot or if there let's say there's a regional ncaa game there's two going on on cbs at the same time if they know they could bail out to another one um they might not have all the redundancies in place as if they're, if you were the only game carrying the entire network for that time slot. Next question. Mickey Makachor from the Philippines back again. How much GPO signals are typically requested by the A1 for mix automation on different types of live sports productions? Uh, I would say anywhere from probably a handful to a lot um, where it, Sometimes on delayed cameras, um, sometimes on handheld cameras, uh, graphics, they uh, want them a lot um, for, you know, if I key the duet machine, uh, it'll open it up for them. And when I lose the key, it turns it off. Um, but I would say any kind of like handheld or delayed camera is where most we see most of those at. Well, let's go to the next question. Jonas Dottel from Stuttgart, Germany. Do you have a favorite story from production? Uh, not really too many favorites. Uh, Sochi closing was, is always a, a good memory. Uh, it was just a fun show. It was, it was with the producer and director that I've been with for a long time. Uh, it was, uh, the first time, uh, the three of us had done a closing together. It was just fun the way that it was, that we all gelled together. Um, and, uh, the American Pharaoh triple crown, uh, at the Belmont, uh, was just a cool moment. Uh, the, the the roar of the crowd, you could just feel uh, almost shaking, shaking the whole stadium and the truck. Um, so just a cool moment. Brad, this has been such an exceptional hour. Thank you so much for helping us do that. Do you have any last little thing for somebody who's maybe thinking about coming into your side of the world of broadcast? What would you recommend for them in maybe 30 seconds? You know, anyone that, that comes in and says like, hey, can you sh show me this and, and give me the tour? Um people who start to really kind of sit down and start TDing, uh, I always tell them there's, there's a couple things you're always asking yourself. Uh, where are we going and how am I getting there? Uh, there's three ways I can get there. Uh, I can cut, I can dissolve, or I can transition pretty much for the most part. Uh, and so I tell them constantly when I was early on, I was saying, asking myself, where am I going and how am I getting there? And for people who are new in the seat, I think that's what you always got to be asking those questions to yourself in your head uh, as you're going through the show. Excellent advice. Thank you so much. This has been a fabulous office hours. We really appreciate your time to come in and help everyone understand the function of a technical director on a big show like this. Uh, it's very hard to get this kind of information. And I think for a lot of young people who might be looking at coming into this area, you've inspired a lot of people. So thank you so much for being Thanks here. Thanks for having me. I, it was great. Um, very quickly, we just have to close up and say thank you so much to all the people we typically thank at the end of the show because they are so incredibly important. All the producers, those of you who fed us questions and drove the show with your votes and questions, we couldn't do this without your driving the content. The uh, crew on the back end unbelievable every day, literally distributed all over the world and putting this show together. And finally, uh, our uh, panelists who come in every day and volunteer their time to make this happen. So we'll see you all tomorrow. Don't forget, After Hours is next. Roll credits. Great show. Thank you so much, Brad. loves it especially it is it's great mr 
trying to figure out a time target to end on because of that little break for the technical thing.